Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome at today's Heidelberg Joint Astronomy Colloquium. It is a real pleasure and an honor to welcome uh, Filippo Fraternari today from the University of Groningen. Filippo is a world leading expert on gas dynamics, on galaxy evolution, on the circumgalactic medium, galactic fountains, and inflows. And uh, I think he's going to touch on several of those topics today uh, during his talk. Uh, his career began at the University of Bologna, where he received his PhD in 2002. After that, he became a postdoctoral fellow in Groningen and then at Astron in Dwingelo. He took up a Marie Curie fellowship at the University of Oxford. And after that, in 2006, returned to Bologna as, a, uh, as an assistant professor. Uh, since 2017, he returned back to Groningen as an associate professor. And since 2019, he is a full professor there. And of particular interest to, to us here in Heidelberg, maybe in 2020, uh, Filippo received the Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel Prize of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. And in 2021, he has actually been awarded the George Darwin Lectureship of the Royal Astronomical Society. And today, Filippo is going to speak to us about the fast rotating and low turbulent disks of high redshift galaxies. And as per the usual tradition uh, here in Heidelberg for the colloquium, I would kindly ask everyone to unmute and uh, give our speaker a very warm welcome. And with that, Philippe, thank you very much. Or is thank all you yours. very much. <laughs> So thank you for the warm welcome and thank you, Diederik, very much for uh, uh, this uh, nice introduction and the invitation, obviously. Um, it would have been obviously much nicer in person, but let's hope that this is just postponed to uh, not far future. So I'll, uh, I'll start uh, uh, sharing my screen and I hope you see my screen and my pointer. Um, so today uh, I'm going to tell you uh, some new results about uh, the um, uh, dynamics of high redshift galaxies coming especially from uh, um, uh, obser uh, observation in uh, emission lines. Um, and uh, uh, I will start with an introduction uh, that covers a little bit the importance of gas dynamics, and then I would move to uh, results at redshift one and especially at redshift four, which will be the main part of my talk. So uh, gas dynamics in galaxies uh, is important for a number of reasons. And it's, it's to some extent, uh, you can say it's a relatively old field that goes back to, uh, from the point of view of the gas, especially uh, to the, the, especially the H1, the first thing, <coughs> sorry. H1 observations of, uh, of the, the 70s and the 80s of uh, nearby galaxies. And in particular, what you see here is a very uh, modern and resolved velocity field that gives us uh, the so-called rotation curve. And this was something that has been realized uh, uh, already, uh, as I was saying, in the 80s, that the rotation curves are flat, as we know, and the, 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 the baryonic uh, matter um, cannot uh, um, reproduce this, this observation at all. So there is a discrepancy, and this discrepancy is interpreted uh, now as the existence of dark matter. Um, but the important thing here is that the, the, the rotation that we measure in the gas can be um, tightly and uh, linked, and in particular, if the gas is cold, is essentially the same as a circular speed. And the circular speed gives us a direct uh, probe of uh, the galactic potential. So um, this, uh, uh, um, the, the analysis of rotation curves gives us the possibility to do several things. Uh, um, trace the galactic potential, determine the dark matter parameters, um, uh, look at the, the shape of the profiles, and also studying the angular momentum. Um, in this talk, I will discuss uh, dark matter parameters and, and casks, but I will not have time to discuss angular momentum, which is very interesting, but it, to some extent, is a, it's another talk. Um, and uh, and the, the, my background uh, started uh, in terms of uh, uh, gas dynamics, really at uh, low redshift, especially with H1 observations. So I'm trying really to export the knowledge that has been accumulated in uh, um, 
the last decades really in H1 also to high redshift. I'm relatively new to the field of high redshift. I, my first paper is from five years ago. So uh, again, what do we do? What can we do with rotation curves? These are uh, nice examples of rotation curve fitting of the compositions that we call it at redshift zero. Uh, you see that uh, this is a trans rotation curve, very extended, and you can fit it with different matter components here. And in particular, now I'm interested in, uh, in the dark matter component, which is this one, which essentially returns two parameters. In this case, these two parameters are left free, and this the, the virial mass of the halo and the concentration. And you know that the, the, from, uh, from actually uh, cosmological and body simulation, we know that the concentration and, uh, and the virial mass should be related to each other. And the, the, the astonishing thing that I, I, find, I find really remarkable that many times by fitting the rotation curve like this, especially when it is extended, we get a, a mass uh, and, and a concentration that actually sits perfectly in the mass concentration relation that comes from an body simulation. So completely different, uh, um, different technique. This is another example, for example, and this is where, where it lies. So to some extent, this, uh, you may call it uh, um, a very uh, nice uh, confirmation that uh, uh, um, NFW halos are, uh, so Lambda CDM for, for large galaxies uh, work very well. But, but also another thing that tells us is that the rotation curves give us extremely accurate dark matter parameters. So we can use them for that. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is the, um, the shape of the profiles. So the, the, the dark matter profiles, uh, uh, the, the famous NW has a certain uh, shapes that is predicted the same to be the same for all galaxies and all structures in the universe. And in particular is characterized by a cusp. And you know that in the center of some galaxies, here you see the example of a couple of dwarf, dwarf galaxies, um, this uh, uh, um, cusp doesn't seem to be there. Uh, the, the, the rotation curve seems to prefer a core provide. And this is, uh, this, is, this is now going into the details of the, of the, of the dark matter distribution, but this may open uh, uh, and, uh, various ways of understanding. Uh, for example, one solution that has been proposed that is now very popular is that the, the dark matter uh, profile has been modified by strong feedback episodes. And so you can have halos that are taking into account this uh, sort of expansion of the dark matter in the inner parts uh, uh, due to feedback uh, and reproduce the data much better. But maybe this is also telling something about the, the, the nature of dark matter itself. Here you see, uh, in this case, that um, density profiles of different dark matter um, uh, types. So cold dark matter gives you the, the cusp, but um, self-interacting dark matter gives you a nice core. And so uh, the, the rotation curve actually uh, may constrain feedback or may or and or can give us clues on uh, the nature of dark matter. And then uh, uh, related to this, although you are not using in this case the whole rotation curve, you are using only the rotation velocity of galaxy. The rotation velocity of galaxy enter uh, uh, very important scaling relations. Uh, the most famous one is probably the baryonic, uh, the, the Tully Fisher relation in general, or, or the baryonic version, as you can see in this in this plot here, but uh, one that I'm very much interested in, and again, I don't have time to discuss it today, is the specific angular momentum stellar mass duration, also as, uh, as obviously uh, you, need, you need a rotation curve uh, in order to construct it. Um, <clears throat> and this, this is a trash of zero, but uh, uh, simulations are now giving us predictions of uh, these scary relations at trash different than zero, and especially uh, there is much discussion whether the, uh, there is strong evolution or no evolution. And, uh, and this is an example of, uh, of uh, the eagle galaxies compared to data, which are the, the, the yellow point at the ship one for the Tully-Fisher relation. So uh, these are really um, becoming um, key benchmarks for, uh, for theories of galaxy formation. Uh, they have been at redshift zero, but now we can do it also um, at redshift uh, higher than zero. 
And the last thing that I want to say is that the gas dynamics doesn't tell us only something about the galaxy, but it tells us something fundamental about the gas. And in particular, uh, if we measure accurately the velocity dispersion, we learn about the importance of turbulence in galaxies, and we may learn about something that is uh, 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 is very important to know, especially for uh, uh, ISM studies, uh, interstellar medium studies, we can learn about the source of turbulence. And so um, <clears throat> this is an example of uh, uh, the uh, velocity dispersion field in which you see uh, that the velocity dispersion in H1 in a local galaxy is always around 10 or a bit more kilometers per second. And this is a result that uh, um, uh, one of my former PhD students obtained that uh, essentially she showed that the kinetic energy that is associated to this turbulence uh, can uh, um, be explained very well uh, throughout the whole disk of, of, of many galaxies just uh, uh, considering supernova feedback and considering supernova feedback at a very low efficiency. Here we're talking about a few percent of the supernova energy that has to go into feeding the turbulence of the ISA. Um, but is this the case also at high redshift? And this is mostly the topic of this talk. And so I'm, I will show this plot several times. This is an attempt to trace the dispersion as a function of redshift. And there have been several claims that the dispersion becomes much higher um, uh, as the redshift for, for high redshift galaxies going to values of uh, 100 or even more kilometers per second. And this is very important, as I was saying before, because we understand how can, can we feed this turbulence. For example, there are models that uh, show that we, you cannot produce typically 100 kilometers per second with feedback. You need gravitational instability. And so we learn about how these are, how common they are and things um, and so on and so forth, but also about the formation of disks and in particular thick disks because higher turbulence means uh, thicker disks that could indeed form uh, thicker from uh, from the beginning for this reason okay so this is uh, the general um, introduction about the importance of gas dynamics and and it is clear from what i said until now that to to do all these wonderful things that i described one need essentially to measure two parameters. And one is the rotation velocity, and the other one is the uh, velocity dispersion, intrinsic velocity dispersion. OK, so in the next part of the talk, I'm going to tell you what is my way of measuring uh, accurate gas kinematics. Um, and first, I'll start just to remind you that these days, uh, we are working mainly with, um, with data cubes. Uh, and data cubes, as I was saying before, uh, are, uh, have been used uh, in radio for decades, but they are now coming the stand, becoming the standard essentially at every wavelength. So um, in, uh, in optical, near infrared, and then now with ALMA uh, in the millimeter uh, regime. And one way to, to deal with data cubes, the, so data cube is by definition in 3D is the cube. You have uh, essentially uh, flux as a function of two uh, positions and also the velocity. And, and one uh, uh, typical way of dealing with this is to extract more than maps. And then, uh, uh, so here you see uh, the, the zero map, which is, uh, which is the fl uh, total flux of the galaxy, the velocity field, the velocity dispersion field. And then uh, use the so-called tilted ring model, which again is, uh, has been proposed a long time ago, but essentially uh, fits the, 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 the kinematics of this disk. And, and what you want to get at the end uh, without the details of determining the inclination position angle, you want to get the rotation velocity as a function of radius. And this is all fine and good if you have data at high spatial resolution. But if you have data at low spatial resolution, this doesn't work anymore. And uh, I'm going to discuss it this briefly by telling you about the beam smearing. You see, beam is another term that comes from uh, the radio uh, background to some extent. So with beam, and uh, I, we mean essentially PSF, um, radio PSF. So I will use them interchangeably. So this is a galaxy. Well, I, I, will, I will focus on one galaxy at zero. 
This is a galaxy observed at redshift zero uh, with the VLA. So it, at incredibly high resolution, here you see a very high resolution velocity field, very high resolution dispersion field. You see the dispersion is around 10 kilometers per second everywhere in the disk. Now I'm going to show you an observation of the same galaxy observed with Effersberg with a resolution that is 100 times worse than, uh, than the previous one. And what you see is that you still see a velocity gradient, but the shape is very different, right? And look at the dispersion. This is not anything more uh, uh, related to the, 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 the turbulence or the intrinsic dispersion. This is completely due to the fact that we, ha we have a resolution that is as big as, as almost the whole galaxy internally, and we are broadening the line just because of the uh, um, instrumental effect. Okay, so here, if you if you naively, so this is this is the rotation curve that uh, you obtain uh, from uh, uh, from the high resolution cube, and but if you naively use this uh, this velocity field to obtain the rotation curve, you make an enormous mistake. Uh, and even more for the dispersion, uh, the dispersion is, uh, is, as I was saying, around 10 kilometers per second. But if you, if you use this field, you see it by eye, you end up around 100 kilometers per second. So this has to be corrected, and there are ways to correct it. And the way I do it is through this software that um, has been uh, uh, written by uh, Enrico Di Teodoro a few years ago. It's called 3D Barolo. And as essentially what it does, it works uh, in, in 3D. It produces uh, um, 3D realization, mock uh, tilted ring models and uh, mock observations, and then that are convolved with the PSF and then uh, compares it to the data until uh, um, it reaches convergence. And, uh, and we have no parametric function. So essentially at the end of, uh, of a fit, we, what we are determining is the uh, value of rotation and the value of dispersion at, di at different radii um, in a galaxy. So this is an example of a data cube. Now I'm going to show you different channel maps. So uh, emission at different velocities. And what you see here is uh, in gray, it's uh, the data. And in, uh, in red is the fit obtained with Barolo. This is a tilted ring. Uh, uh, model fit than, uh, however, in 3D. And you see that this uh, perfectly uh, matching the data at high resolution. And I will show you in the next few slides that we can do it also at low resolution. This code is publicly available. It has become uh, a little bit uh, standard uh, in, uh, in the field of uh, um, emission line uh, kinematics. Uh, it's been used with many, many different uh, uh, instruments and um, and uh, line uh, uh, and emission lines, and also with some mock uh, uh, data from sim from simulated galaxies. Okay, so uh, important to say that Barolo is uh, is originally uh, uh, one of the best wines in the world uh, that comes from this uh, a very tiny area in the northern uh, in the northern. Uh, region in Italy called Piemonte, and uh, and and the, the grape that makes Barolo is Nebbiolo. Uh, again, wonderful grape. But Barolo is sort of the the most noble wine made with this grape uh, because it's aged at least three years. It has to age in wood, etc. And this is uh, the the map of the Barolo region that uh, is. Uh, very detailed and if you zoom it you see that every single field has its own name and Barolo is actually a small town in this uh, in this region. Okay uh, I close this uh, on analogical intermezzo and I go back to the the galaxy and uh, uh, now we are ready to see how Barolo performs in uh, uh, in this uh, 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 data cube. So um, this this is uh, this is the real rotation curve. This is the performance uh, if you simply naively use the velocity field. But if you use Barolo, this is what you obtain. So you recover perfectly the rotation in this galaxy. You see, this is the comparison between model and data in the data cube. But the most important is that if you look here, we also recover perfectly the, 
the value of the intrinsic velocity dispersion. This is important for what uh, I would say later. So essentially, Barolo can do this uh, if there is enough, enough signal to noise, uh, even with uh, a couple of resolution elements across the disk. Okay, so in um, the rest of my talk, uh, I will essentially, as I was saying, discuss initially Galaxy Z Reshit 1, um, very brief passage in Reshit 1.5, and then we go uh, to Reshit 4 and we, we look at ALMA observations, uh, essentially all uh, in uh, C+. Um, so Reshit 1, uh, galaxies uh, uh, with Camus in H alpha, uh, Reshit 1 has been really revolutionized by, by, the, by the VLT instruments. Uh, in particular, uh, in the last years, uh, CAMOS has produced this uh, fantastic surveys uh, that, uh, that, that have, have given hundreds of galaxies. Uh, and uh, there are many, many papers that can, can be quoted that have contributed to this work. Um, and what, uh, what we try to do with this, with this, this wonderful data available. Now, one, one thing that I have to point out that is written here uh, is that, uh, um, I mean, now we give it for granted, but I remember that uh, 10, 15 years ago, it was not at all given the, the fact that most of the galaxies at Reshit 1 especially are uh, rotation dominated. But by far, I mean, now 90% is the estimate of Wisniewski 2019. Uh, and and this, is, uh, this, this is tell us something extremely important about uh, evolution of galaxies uh, that, as I said, is, is a relatively new discovery. So what we did, we took uh, a, a sample of 18 galaxies at Reshit 1, uh, observed with Camus in H alpha. This sample is representative of the parent sample. Um, and uh, and we, we just took a few because, because it, uh, it takes time to analyze them in 3D. And what I'm showing here is the compilation, but let me focus on one of them. So galaxies look like this. This is the H alpha uh, map. This is the H alpha velocity field. And this is a position velocity plot. So I'm going to show several of these. So uh, try to get used to this. This is a, 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 a representation of the velocity along the major axis of the galaxy is essentially uh, the, the contours are, are, are showing, the, the blue contours are showing the, the, the data and the red contours are showing the, the prediction of the model. And you see that on one side, the galaxy is, is approaching on the other side, it's receding, but the shape of the position velocity is telling us a lot about uh, the shape of the rotation curve. You see that the model uh, works quite well. This is the case of a very small galaxy. And the same thing in some sense is seen in this movie. Uh, uh, the movie is, uh, is, showing, is showing channel maps, which are cut of the, the, the cube in uh, essentially vertically here along the position velocity. So um, these are the kind of comparison that we do in contours, especially, and uh, uh, using the same contours to show uh, the quality of the data. Effectively, from this, we are obtaining, as I was saying before, rotation velocities and velocity dispersions. What do we do with them? With rotation velocity, uh, we, have, we have tried to look at the tally fisher relation at, uh, at Reshit 1. Um, at the moment, still at Reshit 1, there is uh, um, a controversy. Uh, it's not clear whether, whether there is a clear evolution or there is no evolution. Uh, there are, uh, here is a compilation of some papers that are claiming one or the opposite. And we uh, found uh, essentially no evolution. The points that you see here are our galaxy Reshit 1, and you see that uh, they are very close to this relation at Reshit 0. And even the relation at Reshit 0, they are not quite uh, all the same. So uh, within uncertainties, we cannot say that there is any kind of evolution. You should you really find the galaxies very far away. So this is, uh, this is what we found. And the second thing that I want to show briefly is uh, the, the, the so-called evolution of the velocity dispersion, which is the same plot that uh, I've shown before. But this time, I'm showing it as uh, as a function of look back time, not, not the redshift. And our, our points are all sitting here at about a velocity dispersion of 30 kilometers per second in H alpha, so ionized gas. 
And this is actually pretty similar to the dispersion that we find at redshift zero. So um, we see no clear evolution for this population, for this, at least this sample of galaxies between redshift one and zero. And this is interesting also looking at the time. We always have to remind ourselves that redshift one is a very long time ago. It's uh, when we see the plots in, in redshift, we don't, we don't think in these terms. This is eight giga years ago and apparently the the what what we see and uh, to some extent also uh, Camus 3D is finding the same the same uh, although there are details that I I can I can tell you later if you're interested but uh, um, the we are seeing that the thin cold disks are probably already settled at Reshit one so. Um, very briefly, uh, I want to flash this galaxy at Reshit 1.5, just because it's an extraordinary galaxy. This is uh, this is a lensed galaxy, a lensed spiral galaxy. The, you see here very clearly the cluster that is producing these uh, multiple images. There are four uh, different images of the galaxy, and in particular, we have studied this one uh, on top that you see because it's uh, it. It's it's a wonderful uh, um, um, uh, magnified spiral, but not distorted. So nature has given us this 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 present to some extent. The galaxy is magnified twenty times, it's very big flux, and the size is blown up four times. And so we have we have had, uh, we studied it with with Muse, and this is the Muse velocity field. We are looking now at oxygen. Two, uh, so we see the doublet. So this is the doublet, and this is the model that we have. And we obtain the, the rotation curve and also the velocity dispersion. The rotation is a bit uncertain because the galaxy is very much um, uh, low inclination, but the dispersion is very is very precise. And we obtain 26 kilometers per second. Again, low dispersion um, uh, in ionized gas. And I'm now going to compare it with this new compilation that I described briefly that has been presented in a paper uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and in here, what you, you see two interesting things. So here, the, the, uh, the, um, the red points are for ionized gas, uh, average of different surveys. Uh, and uh, and the, the black points are essentially for atomic uh, uh, molecular gas, especially the, the curve. That you see here. Uh, what, one important thing to notice is that these two are different, and this we knew they, they are different at redshift zero, so it's, 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 it's normal to expect that they are different also at higher redshift. But another important thing is that, is that the, the new um, data are not showing an incredible growth of the velocity dispersion going up to 100 kilometers per second, while well, we are talking about a, a milder growth that is possibly of the order of two or three between redshift zero and redshift two. Okay, so it's uh, milder than, uh, than a few years ago. And now we are curious to know where uh, our galaxy sits in this plot and it sits there. I'm not sure the bouncy animation works with uh, Zoom, but uh, anyway, uh, now you, okay, good. Now you see, you see where it is in, in any case. So, so we are consistent with, um, with uh, the error bar of, uh, but a little bit on the on the low side. It's only one galaxy, obviously. Okay, so um, we are uh, all uh, ready to go for the last uh, 15 minutes or so of my uh, talk uh, at Reshit 4, between Reshit 4 and 5. And this is divided in three parts. So I'm going to show you uh, a, a different type of results. So the first one is based on uh, essentially two very massive uh, starburst uh, galaxies at Reshit 4.5. It's a paper that I, I've, uh, I'm in the refereeing process uh, at the moment, is in the archive if you're interested to see it. So this is uh, um, um, a presentation of the first galaxy, it's called the Aztec uh, C159. Uh, the galaxy is not uh, uh, seen in HST, so probably because it's very absorbed, but uh, is is seen uh, is gloriously seen in uh, with Alma uh, in uh, in the C plus uh, emission. So this is velocity field, and these are again the, the the position velocity plots. 
uh, where you see overlaid the, the model that we have obtained with Barolo. It's a super Stardust, 700 solar masses per year, and also very massive. So what do we get from this? We get uh, extremely high rotations of order of 500 kilometers per second. This is uncertain. You see that the error is very large because the galaxy, again, is quite uh, um, uh, low, incline, low inclination. So we are, we are measuring a, a relatively small uh, component of the rotation along the line of sight. So we have to correct for the inclination. And whenever the inclination is low, the velocity is uncertain. So that, uh, that is a bit, um, but I mean, probably the errors are very general, so it's there. Um, but the, the dispersion is very well measured and we get a dispersion of order of 30, 40 kilometers per second. So incredibly, very much lower than people expect. But I would say uh, that uh, still we have big errors and we don't quite know if this is correct because 30, 40 kilometers per second is more or less the, res the, the spectral resolution of this data. So what we did, given that uh, the, 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 the spectral resolution is 30 kilometers per second, uh, we uh, produced another data cube. This one with the spectral resolution of 10 kilometers per second. It's incredible that you can do this with ARMA. And, uh, and, and now we have uh, a little bit more uh, patchy sort of velocity, fit, uh, sorry, velocity fit, so position velocity plot, but you see, that uh, still we can trace it quite well, we can fit it quite well, and we get a dispersion now that is around 20 kilometers per second. This gives a V over sigma of 20, 30 kilometers, 30, 30 sorry, uh, which, is, um, which is incredible. At, uh, it's it's a, a very massive, is the, the value that you, you obtain for a very massive spiral galaxy at redshift zero. However, if you look at uh, the, the amount of stellar feedback that you can expect, especially supernova feedback uh, in a galaxy like this, as I was saying, 700 solar masses per year of star formation, um, given that the mass of the gas is very high, you actually expect to have a sigma around 30 kilometers per second with an efficiency of 10%. So if the efficiency is a bit lower than 10%, or I mean, our errors are certainly included 30 kilometers per second, probably this simply tell, is telling us that uh, feedback uh, is actually enough to feed the turbulence in, uh, in, this, um, in this high redshift galaxy. The second galaxy I want to show, it's, uh, it's a galaxy that from the point of view of the, of the orientations is on the other side because it's almost uh, edge on. So in this case, the rotation velocity that we obtain is very certain. It, uh, um, there is almost no correction for inclination. And we are talking again about 500 kilometers per second, a bit more. The dispersion is actually um, quite uncertain. And you see here an attempt to uh, put, uh, uh, it's not really a rotation curve decomposition because we cannot do it, but. Uh, to put matter components on top of this rotation curve. And, and you see that this very big uh, uh, yellow band is the, uncert the current uncertainty that we have in the stellar mass because there are very different determinations in the literature. And, uh, and, and the rotation curve actually can help us very clearly to say, well, the mass should be on the high side. And another thing also, the, the gas mass determined in the literature is clearly much lower than what you need to reproduce these uh, rotation velocities, which is the green uh, curve here. And so that, those, uh, that also should be revised by a factor five or so. So very big revisions that can, can be obtained uh, dynamically. Okay, so, but the, the point here, uh, about the specific galaxy, uh, we have two galaxies, they, they are telling us the same story. The, 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 there are rotations that are incredibly fast, fi 500 kilometers per second, turbulence around 30 kilometers per second. What can they be and what, where, where, how we can imagine they can evolve? So they, we are, I'm rotating at 500 kilometers per second and redshift 4.5. What can my evolution be? Um, this type of galaxies, uh, submillimeter, galaxies in general, but Starbucks uh, uh, 
high rise of stars in general are thought to evolve into um, early type galaxies at rate zero. Um, but uh, do we have any other evidence, dynamical evidence that this, these uh, beasts that we are observing are similar to early type galaxies? And the evidence is there, and it is the following. Here you see uh, a couple of uh, um, uh, global profiles obtained from uh, CO uh, disks in elliptical galaxies. So some elliptical galaxies, about 20% have CO in the very center that is rotating very fast. And here you can see actually the, the velocity this, the, that they are rotating at. The, here we are talking about 500 kilometers per second because the whole extent of the profile is almost a thousand kilometers per second. These features are very, this, this CO disks are very small, typically one KPC, like the, 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 the disks that we see in high redshift galaxies, but they are much less massive. However, they probe the potential and they tell us that the potential of this high redshift uh, uh, starburst is similar to the potential that uh, we see in uh, massive ellipticals today. And so to, to, to try to prove this, we did another experiment. We took these uh, um, values of uh, essentially rotation uh, of, of the CO disks in ellipticals, and we put them in this plot that is called uh, um, Taddy Fisher analog for early type galaxies. And our uh, to high redshift galaxies are here in this region, and you would say that this is not, this doesn't look very good, but it, they are there if we are considering only their stellar mass. If I now add to the stellar mass the gas that they have, that they are consuming very fast and is going to turn into stars very quickly, then they end up there. And you see that that the, you, this is telling us possibly that they don't even have to get much more gas accretion or anything. They just have to consume their gas, turn it into stars. They have the right potential well to become very quickly uh, like uh, um, uh, local elliptical. And then of course there are, there are so th this is, the, I call it the dynamical evidence of the evolution into uh, early type. There are complications here because if you have, you have, you have, uh, uh, a galaxy, a, a, a disk of gas, very massive, that is rotating at 500 kilometers per second and forms stars, the stars are probably fast rotating, at least at the beginning. And so you have to get rid of that, that rotation to form what is probably a slow rotator, uh, given that the massive one, massive early type are slow rotators. And, uh, well, we don't still know how this uh, can be achieved. Um, Okay, the, the second topic that uh, is still related to Reshit 4.45 that I want to discuss is the, this new observation of a really remarkable this galaxy at Reshit 4.8. So I show this by uh, showing you first the, the ALMA cycle, this may be even cycle zero actually, uh, observations. So we are talking about uh, 2000, uh, 14. This was one of the first uh, cases in, in which uh, uh, people have, uh, have determined the, uh, the, the presence of rotation at Reshit uh, 5, essentially, here. And, uh, <clears throat> and now we have new data from cycle 6 of this galaxy, and uh, these are remarkable. So if you haven't seen it before, prepare yourself, breathe, and are you ready? There you are. This is, this is a galaxy at Reshit 5, and you would never say it if uh, if I just showed you the velocity field. You would say this is a this is a, really a local galaxy. Here, look at the the, the resolution of uh, Alma. We are talking about 700 parsec. Here we are several resolution elements across the disk, and uh, the disk is incredibly regular. You see the velocity field is is very regular. And, uh, and again, uh, it's, it's really remarkable that ALMA can observe this. And it's also remarkable that the universe can build such a disk in such a short time. And you may rem re remember this, this paper that came out in Nature last year, somehow similar object, although here we have, as you can see, a resolution that is higher than that. 
And again, we model it in 3D. Uh, this is the, the position velocity plot. And also in this case, uh, we are, I'm going to discuss it in a second, just, just to say that the, the, um, yeah, the, the model is, looks quite good. We have lower seed ones. So what we, do we get in this case? The rotation curve now, you see it's, I mean, it's not just two, three points, it's several points. So we can really do a rotation of the composition. Um, and the dispersion also, you can we can measure it and is around 40 kilometers per second. So the rotation curve, the composition, what does it tell us? Essentially, it tells us that there is a, a concentration of, of the star that we don't see because we don't have uh, the resolution to see it, but we see it through the rotation curve. We call it bulge. It has to be something like a bulge, but again, we don't, we don't see it in shape, so it's difficult to determine. And this, as far as I know, is the is the evidence, the uh, the let's say earliest bulge uh, ever observed. Although we are observing dynamically, the question is how can you form a bulge at uh, Rashid five? Uh, the the formation mechanisms um, that we know are uh, uh, are a few, but they have to be extremely quick because at Rashid five, the universe is 1.2 giga years old. And this galaxy has probably uh, had, had a life of uh, quite a bit less than that. So this is uh, quite remarkable that we see uh, such a regularly rotating disk uh, in a relatively hostile environment and uh, rapid formation of, uh, of the bulge. And in the last uh, uh, few minutes, oh, sorry, the, the, uh, the future is uh, in, with ALMA is uh, it's, uh, uh, very interesting. This is uh, um, um, the work that my new PhD student is starting to do. So she started the PhD uh, a few months ago and she's building a sample uh, from the ALMA archive. This is uh, one of her uh, early preliminary results of a galaxy at Rashid 4.5, 4.4, uh, that also shows uh, um, a V over sigma of order 10. Uh, and also the other thing that I want to tell you is that we are uh, uh, waiting for new ALMA data that hopefully will come this um, spring or summer. And uh, uh, we will then have at the end a sample of, now we're talking about more than 10 galaxies, at a resolution of 0.1 r second. The PI is again Federico Lelli, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I cannot wait to see this data, see what we find. And uh, as I was saying, the last, in the last few minutes, I'm going to uh, say a few things about uh, uh, galaxies at the redshift uh, four, between four and five with uh, gravitational lensing. So this is, uh, uh, we are stepping outside the, the capability of Barolo but we are using uh, the same logic. So this is a software that to some extent is even more complex, was written by Francesca Rizzo. And, uh, and this software combines the, the fitting of the gravitational lens with the, the 3D fitting of the kinematics uh, a la Barolo, if you, if, you, if you allow me that. And so it is, it is a, a, a multi-parametric fit that uh, works uh, extremely well as we have determined in, the, in mock data. And now we have applied it to real data. And the first uh, galaxy that have been uh, um, treated with, uh, with this software uh, uh, appeared uh, in, in this nature paper uh, this year. And here you can see it. The, these are, this is the moment zero C plus observation, moment one, and these are the reconstruction that the software can make. It's incredible that from a perfect ring with this uh, uh, gradient along the ring, we, we, we can determine that the galaxy is actually a very beautiful disk that is rotating so regularly. These are the, the position velocity plots that we get. Here, uh, I, we go beyond amazing because the resolution at Reshit 4 becomes 60 parsec. So it's really, it's really science fiction. Um, what do we get from this? So the most important thing that I want to tell you is that uh, we can do the decomposition of the rotation curve. And again, we see that there is a very compact component in the center. And in this case, we can even determine the scale radius of uh, the effective radius of this stellar component, which is 200 parsecs. So imagine 
how, how compact it is. Um, and yes, to some extent, this allows us to see the stellar component pre-JWST, and then we would see if, if we were right or not. And the other important thing that I want to say is that this is really unexpected in terms of uh, models of galaxy formation. Here, there is a compilation of predictions from the model. And you see the tower point, these are two different determinations of uh, our V over sigma value is really um, away from the prediction. And Francesca uh, Rizzo is now analyzing other six galaxies, which uh, again are uh, very similar characteristics to this one. And this is a very preliminary plot that has not been published yet, uh, will be submitted very soon where you see where all the other galaxies lie, and you see that we are always uh, way above the prediction of the models. Um, uh, this is illustrious, uh, by the way, uh, uh, technically is H alpha, so we are not, we, it doesn't really completely have to be on top of this determination, which are uh, C plus, but the discrepancy is quite high. So this is uh, maybe challenging. And this is the position of the two galaxies that I uh, have in, the, in my paper that I present before. And this is the position of the Lelis galaxy. So we are building up a picture here that really is challenging uh, our current models of galaxy formation. And so I get to the end of the talk. And these are my conclusions briefly. Uh, I hope I convince you that 3D fitting is critical to determine the uh, kinematics of uh, and dynamics of high redshift galaxies. Um, star forming galaxies at redshift one uh, seen in ionized gas tends to show uh, uh, rotation dominated, okay? Low, low uh, gas velocity dispersion. Tally Fisher not, uh, not evolving much from redshift zero to redshift one. And then galaxies are between redshift four and five are showing clearly a uh, cold disk and th that are also very fast rotating with V over sigma uh, of order 10 or larger. And this is a question whether models can, can produce this, this type of galaxies. And then, uh, and then I show you that there is clearly a very early formation of, uh, of stellar bulges. And also uh, the question remains, how do these galaxies, fast rotating disk can uh, turn into uh, slow rotators, uh, uh, elliptical or uh, early type galaxies. So uh, this was my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Filippa. This is truly spectacular, I think. So I'm sure there are many questions. And uh, while people find the raise hand button, I'll ask the first one, uh, which uh, I have several actually, but I'll, I'll just stick to one for now. Uh, and it relates to the evolution of the baryonic Tully Fisher relation. So you show that uh, these high redshift targets, if you account for their gas content, they actually shift up nicely and then they suggest little uh, evolution. But of course, these are the progenitors of very massive galaxies today. And the most mal massive galaxies quench the earliest. So to some degree, you might expect if you go to lower mass galaxies, that there's actually maybe a little bit more evolution of that relation with redshift, which would imply that the slope would change. Have you thought about this? And do you have observations that might point towards resolving that question? So you, uh, you are referring to this, right? Yes. 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 So meaning uh, populating this, this area a little bit. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I haven't looked into this, but the the, the other galaxies that I discussed at Redshift uh, uh, four uh, are all at lower rotational speed. So I have only two at five hundred kilometers per second. So it's something that I can I can certainly check and see. But um, but it is true that in that case, I mean, uh, you really have the impression with these very massive ones that. Um, that um, the, the the consumption of the gases is going to be extremely rapid, and uh, and really with that you are done with forming the the, the stellar mass of the galaxy. I mean, yeah. I'm exaggerating obviously, but uh, they are very much advanced in terms of the evolution of radiant redshift four. No, that's really clear. That's really clear. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I would be interested to, to 
learn about the mass defendants indeed at some point. Cool. I see a lot of hands up actually. So I'll quickly go to the first question and I hope the hands appear in the order that they went up because otherwise I'm being unfair. But the first question, uh, Robin, please go ahead. Hi, Filippo. Uh, Hi, Robin. Nice talk. Um, thanks. So my question was um, about the Barolo code. So it was, I found it quite striking how well you could recover the, the velocity curve and the velocity dispersion from the, um, from, from the first part of your talk. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I guess the, the underlying assumption there is that uh, the observed galaxy um, is a rotating disk and can be fitted with this uh, um, tilted ring model. So, so how, how, how good is this assumption for, for high redshift galaxies where, where you have a lot of uh, um, disturbed systems, I, I would guess? So uh, uh, th this is true to some extent, but I have, I have to say that the, uh, actually your question, Robin, I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot resist, uh, makes me, because I, I had a quiz that I didn't show you because I thought I didn't have time. So I'm going to make you this quiz. Which of these two position velocity plots is from a galaxy at Rashid 4? Well, I would say they're the first. And you are wrong because <laughs> it's the second. <laughs> so with this, I, I, I hope I, I, uh, I answered your question. What I'm trying to say is that this one is at Rashid 0. And we know perfectly that it's a rotating disk. And this one is one of the galaxies that I showed before is a Rashid 4. And I think there is no doubt it is a rotating disk because, the, because it's, not just, it's not just a velocity gradient here we are talking about. It's really a pattern, a shape. You see this accumulation of emission here at the top, very many contours less in the center and then, and then here. It's really the pattern of rotation and Barolo, 3D Barolo essentially recognizes this pattern of fit. Okay, so essentially, if you would have a, a galaxy which doesn't follow this pattern, would be follow... would be a bad fit. Okay, he he know he recognizes that. Yes. Okay, thank you. Splendid, uh, Maxim, please for the next question. Hi, thanks very much for the talk. Um, if I can come back to the evolution of the um, gas velocity dispersion that you showed at a redshift up to one, two or three, I don't remember. Can you tell us a bit more about the selection of these galaxies? Like, I think it's related to Diedrich's question, but effectively, are you selecting the same galaxies uh, at redshift, say one or two and, and at redshift zero in this kind of uh, evolutionary plots? Um, so we're talking about the velocity dispersion or the V over sigma? The velocity dispersion, I think that was like in the first part of the talk. So in fact, in fact, in that, because really at Rashid 4, the selection uh, you can yeah, Richard, you you is the galaxies that we can see, okay. So, so when we are talking about this type of galaxies here, um, I, uh, obviously the points at Rashid, uh, at Rashid 1 are, uh, to some extent, in, in every case, is, is a better sample. At Reshit, uh, uh, sorry, at Reshit zero. At Reshit one, uh, at Reshit one, uh, there, is, uh, there, there is an initial selection. And then I, I have to admit to you that when I show this, 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 this um, uh, Talifisher, for example, also these points here, uh, these galaxies have then been selected by us because we, we didn't want to use galaxies, we would have not obtained reliable kinematics. But uh, what, what we have to admit is also the, especially I'm, now I'm talking uh, for the Tally Fisher relation, galaxies are actually zero have also been selected. Yeah, I'm so just wondering if, like if there is a galaxy that is, If there is a galaxy that is obviously showing an interaction, it would not be in the Tally Fisher at Rashid zero. And, and, and I think it should not be also in the Tally Fisher at Rashid one. And so, and so I mean, it's, it's, fair, it's as fair as we can do it, I think. Okay, thanks. Uh, Sebastian, next question. 
Um, hi, Filippo. That was a really, really interesting, um, really interesting results. I'm very excited to see what Barolo can can actually do. Um, and I was wondering uh, if you can tell us more about the, um, what your results imply for the connection between dark matter halos and galaxies at high redshift, and whether the dynamics picture fits the picture from abundance matching and or simulations. Um, and also if you, if there have been comparisons of the velocity dispersion evolution with redshift that actually use the cold gas component. I know that the big box simulations don't actually have cold gas, so it might be more difficult, but maybe in simulations like fire and others that do have cold gas. Okay, so, so the, first, uh, uh, the first question, um, um, one thing that I can say is that, but this is not just our result. Ga galaxies at uh, high redshift tend to be baryon dominated. But this is almost uh, necessarily the case, especially for the galaxies that we are observing here, right? Uh, let, let's take this, this one, for example, where the rotation curve is certain. L look at the, the, the dark matter. The dark matter is very low and yeah. it cannot be different from that because the, the, actually in Lambda CDM, the, the concentration at Reshit uh, 4 is more or less the same for every structure, is around 3. And once, uh, once you have such a low con concentration to have a contribution to this point, you should put uh, the mass uh, of, uh, of a galaxy cluster. Otherwise, you, you, the dark, new dark matter is, is very low. Now, we are not yet, I would say, in the position of actually fitting the, the dark matter halo, which is what we would like to do to, 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 to check whether this is, this is true. The concentration mass relation uh, works, uh, works also at uh, Rashid 4. Uh, for that, we need certainly um, um, a, a way to trace the stellar component, so JWST first comes to mind. And, and the, other, the other question that you were, you were asking about Avanda's matching, I have, I have a quick slide uh, at the end. Um, so we did this, uh, this experiment at Reshit zero, actually, uh, if I can find it, which is this. So this is, uh, this is um, uh, a comparison between Avanda's matching, which is given by the Moster uh, relation, and uh, our determination of, uh, of the the, um, the uh, halo mass, and so in this case, is the, actually the, the, um, the mass fraction uh, 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 as a function of stellar mass. And you see that many, so this is with uh, rotation curve fitting. Many points are very much uh, um, in agreement with the master relation. But when we go up here, our galaxies all tend to be above. And actually, with this famous peak that people see that should be the, the peak star formation efficiency, uh, we don't see it at all. Essentially, we have no peak uh, for spiral galaxies. So this is quite interesting. But again, uh, I don't think we are at the level that we can do this at uh, higher than zero reliability. Uh, maybe one, but uh, uh, maybe one, yeah, but not more. And uh, sorry, I forgot your second question at this point. I was just, uh, if you, if there are simulations where you can compare the actual uh, uh, cold Yes, gas. so I don't, I, that, I, I don't know, but what I know is that, for example, in Illustris, uh, um, the, they, they don't have a colder gas than this. So, so this is the only gas we can compare it with, but uh, I haven't looked at fire. Thanks. Okay, I have a, a question on uh, behalf of Dominika Vilitsalek. Um, so, um, are, have you been looking at the environments of these high redshift galaxies to assess whether they are found in preferred places in the universe? So, especially the rapidly rotating, rotating ones. Uh, um. To be honest, uh, I don't exactly know what is the environment of these galaxies. This comes from uh, 
from uh, surveys, uh, essentially in, in several cases targeting submillimeter galaxies, so that have been that have been found just because they have an enormous flux mm -hmm. in submillimeter, and um, uh, I, to, I, I don't I don't know if they are. Uh, these two are peculiar, but they are they are they are in that class. So I don't think they are peculiar. Actually, they are of that type type of type of sources. But okay. they are not in, obviously interacting. If that that right. is the question, there is no companion beside. I think yeah, maybe the question was, was more about stellar or of, of galaxy clustering. So indeed, uh, if well, it, one of the two actually as uh, as another. Uh, um, uh, and a companion sort of that we see in HST, but doesn't have uh, doesn't uh, doesn't appear in Alma. So either it's a bit far away and goes out of the band. Uh, we don't quite know. Okay, thank you. Um, I see two more hands up. Uh, ben, I think you were first. Sure, thank you. Wonderful talk as always. Uh, really cool results. I'm puzzled about how. Uh, basically, my mind is torn in two directions about these very massive rotation-supported disks. On the one hand, I think, ah, they're nice, smooth, thin disks. Feedback must be quite weak here because it's not disrupting the, the, the ISM. It's not pumping your sigma up. But on the other hand, if you have these massive gas-rich disks, there's this sort of a uh, wide field of studies that suggest uh, it should be violently unstable to forming these large clumps. And there are studies that show that feedback can, I think I worked on one with Lucio Meyer a while back that showed feedback can break apart these clumps and smooth your disc out, give you kind of a more rotation supported thing. So I'm curious what your I, uh, intuition is about uh, what these results say for the state of feedback in these really extreme high redshift environments? So, um, I, I would say two, two things very briefly. One is that, my, uh, uh, as I was trying to, to show with this simple calculation, you can look at the, the paper for more details. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you if you consider really uh, a very simple prescription for stellar feedback, um, mm -hmm. and you consider that, so, so effectively the, you are, you are, every supernova is giving out uh, 10 to the 51 and you, and you put some efficiency of the gas that is going to go in, the, sorry, the energy that is going to go into turbulence. Mm -hmm. Now, the, your star formation rate is extremely high and that we would think I, I should have an enormous turbulence. But the gas is the gas mass is also very high, and so to some extent this compensates, and and you end up with expecting a turbulence that is of the order of the of the turbulence that we are observing for efficiency of ten percent, as you can see from this formula. So this may may, may answer a little bit. The other the other question that the the, the other thing that I have in mind. Uh, an impression that I have really looking now at this accumulation of data that are showing more or less the same picture is that uh, this, the, the, some of these galaxies, they may even have, have had the merger not long time ago because they have the bulges. How did these bulges form? Maybe with mergers or maybe with instabilities of some sort. But somehow the, the cold gas uh, goes back into a disk, it seems extremely quickly. The, 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 it, this is reasonable because at these velocities and with such a small disk, the dynamical times are very short. Uh, now I don't completely remember the top of my head, but we are talking about a few times 10 to the seven, I think. So very short. And you, you, so you, you, it, the moment in which they are particularly chaotic, that may happen, maybe you are not catching it because most of the time they are, uh, they are very regular. Cool. So. Thank you. So, uh, Ralph, please go ahead. So, thanks to you, That was an amazing um, presentation of exciting new results. Um, in a sense, you have kind of answered my question because I was wondering about your fitting about two things. One is bars, whether you, I mean, we know in the present 
the universe most or many spirals are barred galaxies. And I was wondering whether you can pick it up. And the other one was about mergers, whether the reg it's only the regularity of the rotation curve that makes you exclude merger events to see. But I think you addressed the later one because you would see even if there was a recent merger in the very cold gas that you pick up, you quickly go back to a more normal and regular state and you yes. would wipe out this. Yes. So I guess and that is so your... that, that's my impression. But and and about the bars, uh, uh, I would say that uh, if you have uh, velocity fields like this, you you certainly are starting to be able to see uh, relatively big bars, because mm -hmm. you you expect uh, in velocity mm -hmm. fields you you expect uh, a, a, per, a particular pattern for almost every orientation of the bar. There are some orientations that you will not see it. And, and here is not quite there in the sense that the, the, the lines, uh, where I'm talking about the, the, how parallel are these lines uh, in, uh, and, and how perpendicular is the minor axis, at least in the inner part with respect to the major axis. It's something that would be distorted if there is a bar. So you would see a tilt of the tilted rings that you, you can see easily check. The, the so typical, the, the typical signature of a bar is actually an S shape here, something yeah. like this. Something, something, but uh, when the, you have a strong bar, it's really, it's really very, very strong. And then you would see it also in, in the data cube. Uh, obviously, I'm not, I'm not saying we uh, exclude any bar here, but, uh, but uh, a strong bar, you can exclude it dynamically also with, um, with these observations, I think, start to with this type of resolutions. Okay, cool, thanks. So I have a, a very uh, short question, which is that with 3D Barolo, you, uh, you basically move some of the energy that used to be in velocity dispersion, you put it in rotation effectively, right? And um, obviously that changes the fragmentation length scale of your disk, the tumor length becomes a lot shorter. But does it also change the stability of the disk overall? So does it change tumor Q or does the product of the velocity dispersion and the epicyclic frequency roughly stay constant? So uh, I actually have a plot that I left out from uh, the, the lensed galaxy that we published in, uh, in Nature last year, which is this mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, this is uh, our Q for this is, I remind you, so this galaxy is actually 4.2. So here we have uh, extremely high uh, resolution thanks to the lens. Yeah. And then uh, you see Q is beautifully one <laughs> across yeah. the disk. Yeah. Really quite impressive. The disk is small as all the others, but still Q is very much consistent with uh, marginally unstable. So. So that's consistent in principle with uh, poorer fits where that energy was not sat in rotation, but was set in a dispersion component. So that Q still ends up being roughly one. I guess uh, somehow the, the parameters can conspire yeah. right? <laughs> to get this. But uh, yeah, this is the only case in which, um, in which uh, I think uh, we, we looked at Q. I uh, don't quite remember, but... Uh, quite remarkably close to one, I would say. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, there have there've been a very large number of questions and great discussion afterwards. Of course, uh, if people are interested in following up uh, with Filippo and, and maybe have more questions or would like to uh, book a meeting for a follow-up chat, uh, we already discussed this yesterday briefly, but you're all very welcome to either write me or Filippo directly. Um, and then we can arrange that. Uh, of course, in a non-corona situation, we would have done this in person and uh, in Heidelberg. But I think, um, great, Filippo, thank you that you're, you're willing to do that nonetheless. Uh, I will briefly share a uh, screen, so I'll steal your screen sharing yes. uh, to announce next week's uh, talk. Or actually, no, it is not next week, it's the week after. So next week, we do not have a joint colloquium. But the week after, Peter Johansson from the University of Helsinki will be uh, speaking uh, and talking about simulating black hole dynamics and gravitational wave emission in galactic scale simulations. Um, with that, we come to the end of uh, today's joint colloquium. I would kindly like, like to ask everyone again to unmute and 
give uh, Filippo a very warm thank you for a fascinating talk today. So thank you. <laughs>